Greetings, everyone. I'm Dr. Chiara Simeon Di Francesco, and this is my husband, Romuald B. Simeon, author of Love, Love Letters from Your Father. And he is going to be sharing another adventure from The Ordinary Man, the miraculous life story of these interventions of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit in his life. And the purpose that he shares is so that you may be edified and inspired and know that you can call on the Lord. So, Romo, would you start us with a prayer, please? Yes. Okay. Lord Jesus, let us just do your will. Wherever it leads, we say yes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'd also like to introduce to you therapist Guadalupe Flores in Texas and Cesario uh, Fernandez Gomez in Spain. So they will be participating in our interview of Romold and they may have some interesting perspectives and uh, questions to ask and clarify as you go along yes. and, and share how this might inspire them or apply to their life. So we'll go forward in Jesus' name. So go ahead, Romold, and tell us this, this scenario that you have on your heart and mind to share with us. Well, the one I want to share is how when we drive, we put ourselves in the care of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and the Trinity, and the Trinity, and I always say the prayer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, take care of us on our way. Show us what to do, and do not let us make any mistakes mm -hmm. because to say a mistake can be disastrous yeah especially driving yes especially driving and of course i used to drive i don't drive anymore it's too dangerous i cannot see exactly things go too fast for me look over here a little bit okay yeah. They go too fast for me. And so I want to talk about this experience I had on the New Jersey Turnpike. I was anxious and I was with Kiara. I have a real, a very, had a very old car that did not work too well. And I had to go over a bridge to get into, from New Jersey into Delaware. And that is where the retreat house was, where I had to give teaching. And I was on the highway going towards that bridge. And I was trapped between two big transport trucks. The twelve wheeled trucks. So I was trapped and I was very frightened because something was happening with my motor that I could not decipher. There was a big noise, wasn't there? It was a big noise, and there was smoke coming out of the front wheel, the front motor part of the motor. And I was driving along, going at top speed, 55 miles an hour. And I was on one side of the road. There was a big trailer truck there and one on the right side. So I decided to slow down and go to the one on the right side. We were sandwiched in between. We were sandwiched between them. That's why I pulled back and I got to the one on the right side where it was a little clearer for me. And 
I was free and I prayed to the Lord to save me because smoke was coming out of the engine. You had like two seconds. Yeah, it just, and as soon as I came across the right side, there was a, an exit. I came over the exit without stopping and came right in to a repair garage and flames came out of the motor. The wheel. Flames. Yeah. The wheel. The wheel rolled the wheel. off the and, vehicle. And the motor. And the motor. motor was smoking and a fire in the wheel. And the wheel. And I came right into the garage of repair garage. That I did not even know existed. And the wheel rolled off the whole vehicle, off the axle. And we were safe. We were safe. And I says, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Trinity. We're safe. Thank you, Lord. And that was it. They repaired everything. And then I went on my way later. So we so experienced the saving love of God beyond what we're even aware of, of how he stepped right in. You know, he just stepped in and took over. There was an exit. It was just right a matter there. of seconds. And how many times, there's been so many other times where he saved our lives oh, from yeah. stupid driving mistakes. That too. It's just that he's so merciful. In San Francisco. And when it's not your time, he's protecting you. <laughs> <laughs> he knows the scripture says your days are numbered in heaven. We don't know what number it is. Not humanly, but they're numbered by the Lord. The Lord knows when it's time to go home. So. Would you like me to share how he rescued me from my situation? Sure. So, <laughs> one of the most dramatic times that I remember is I was three days before my graduate school started. I had just graduated with my bachelor's in philosophy and theology in Connecticut from Holy Apostles College. And I was going to go to Columbia University. Oh, but I yes. Was, I, remember I, that. I remember this. I remember that one. And I was in Virginia giving a healing and dialogue workshop to some friends of ours and staying with them. And... I was poor as a church mouse, so I just had this old VW van, and apparently, well, I knew nothing about cars, and apparently I did not have it checked thoroughly enough when I bought this used vehicle. So I'm on the highway to Berryville, Virginia. Berryville, some of our listeners may know, is the place of the Trappist Monastery. So my wonderful spiritual director, Father William, who's now looking after me from heaven, That's right there. Father William mm -hmm, O'Connor, he, um, he was waiting for me to come visit him. So I was driving down the highway, and it was, I was maybe 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour. It was, I was in the fast lane of the highway, and... My windows were open. It was a summer day right before a bee. a bee came in the window and landed on a white towel. And I had a friend that had kind of gotten me nervous about bees. Apparently, she was allergic. So I leaned over to take the towel and throw it out the window, you know, or let it fly off. As I did, the front left wheel of the vehicle hit about one or two inches of the grass divider in the center. 
Well, when it did it, it threw the entire vehicle out of control. There must have been something wrong with the steering wheel or steering mechanism or something. It wasn't right. The whole thing went out of control and the van uh, rolled three times. And I had what? camping gear in it. And I had, this, I had this out of body experience of hearing my own voice say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm hearing my body and my voice say Jesus, but and you're rolling over, and I'm rolling over, and off the highway, on the, the highway, car. no, on the highway, in the middle of the road, and it was rush hour traffic, and some motorist found me standing on my two feet in the highway. The entire vehicle was crushed. All of the canned goods were twisted. If you could imagine a can of beans or whatever, just totally twisted. All the metal of the whole vehicle was twisted. And all the glass was broken. And I was uncut, only with a broken clavicle, praising Jesus at the top of my lungs, delirious, but standing. And some motorist picked me up in the middle of the highway. I didn't get run over. Stopped and brought me to the local hospital. And I lived and survived. And But first when I went into, oh, first he brought me to a doctor's office. And I, if you talk about witnessing, right? All my inhibitions about witnessing and my shyness were gone. I was in the waiting room on some stretcher. And I was praising God at the top of my lungs and saying, praise Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is wonderful. Believe in Jesus. <laughs> and all the people in the waiting room were looking at this girl on the cot. <laughs> and from there, they transported me um, with the bump on the head to the local hospital and discovered, gave me all the x-rays and all of that. But it has been such a life-changing experience to experience the Lord transporting me out of that vehicle. And one day, I think it was the next day or two days later, you had to go to I had to go to Columbia, Columbia with my arm in a sling. And at that time, there was nobody able, my vehicle was demolished. There was nobody able to transport me. So this, this um, Franciscan brother from a local parish was so kind as to drive me there. But he had to get right back to the monastery. And it was, look, I don't know, five hours or whatever, whatever it is from Virginia to New York City. So he had to drive and get back. And so he drove me and he had my boxes that I had packed in, in my dorm room. He loaded them all onto my bed. And I had the least expensive room that one could find because I was putting myself through graduate school. So it was about the size of a bathroom. And the boxes were on the bed, and I had a broken clavicle. And the Holy Spirit gave me the power. I, I couldn't lie down on the bed, right? And there was no space on the floor. So somehow he gave me the strength to take big boxes of books and whatever with one arm and lift them onto a shelf. I was too shy to ask these strangers in the dorm who I did not know to help me. So I managed to get the boxes off the bed and managed to fall into bed and started graduate school the next day. So praise be to God getting me through that. He gives us strength and he gives us, the scripture says, he gives us the grace and the power that we need to overcome when we need it. <laughs> I've never been so strong since probably. <laughs> and so... Those are our two very special adventures to share with you all today. Yes. So I'm wondering how, um, what this is like for you both, Cesario and Guadalupe, as you're thinking of how the Lord has intervened in your lives and, you know, what comes to mind and heart? What, you know, what, what uh, are you thinking and feeling? Go ahead, Guadalupe. Definitely. I guess maybe we can get a clarification from your perspective, uh, Professor Rami Wright and Dr. Chiara, in this experience. Um, there's often a lot of confusion, you know, 
specifically in those two things that you were talking about when, you know, our days are numbered, but also not, not putting aside the power of prayer and divine intervention, that it is a reality in the church. What would be the best way that you can clarify this for us, you know, and, and the world who's seeing us so that there is no contradiction? Our days are number. God does know everything, but divine intervention and the prayer power still has its place. Roma, you want to adjust that? I can't understand her. Well, um, I'll start and then maybe you understand. She's asking, how do we look at um, divine intervention here and yet our days are numbered and in this situation, God intervened? You know, how do we look at it humanly and then also the divine intervention? I mean, the way I explain it to myself, Guadalupe, is it wasn't my time. God wanted me to become a psychologist. God wanted me to help people. God wanted me to be alive to also take care of him. And so he knew that Romeworld would need me. And, um, and he knew each and every client that would need me. And and so he preserved me, um, and I was really dedicating myself to the Lord. I think that that made, makes a difference. I mean, I wasn't just trying to pursue glory or money. For me, it was a ministry. It is a ministry. It was a ministry. I was going through tremendous hardships in order to do what I needed to do, and I felt it as a calling and a vocation from him. And as the scripture says, I set my face like flint and come hell or high water, I was going to go forward and do what I believed he wanted me to do to the best of my ability and knowledge. And there was a purity in, in me in that, I think. And his mercy also covered me. You know, I wasn't to my knowledge, in any state of mortal sin. And I was trying to cooperate with him in every way that I knew. I was trying to live a virtuous life. So all of these things were first and foremost. I was putting Jesus first in my life. I was praying every day. I was praying the scriptures every day. And with all my heart, my mind, and my soul, I was seeking him. So I do believe that that makes a difference also. Although God can, you know, as he says in the scripture, he lets the grace and the rain fall on the good and bad alike. So, you know, maybe if I was an evil sinner, he would have done the same thing. I don't know. Yes, Romo, you have a thought. Yeah, I have a more than a thought. I have another incident. Okay. At that same time that she was going to university, I had problems myself. And a nurse that I knew in a prayer group said that was, I went to her house and something was wrong. She says, your lips are not the right color. Like it's lost blood. And I said, what do I do? She says, well, my brother is a doctor at FDA in Washington, and you may have trouble with your heart. This is a true story. You may have something with your heart. I did not know I had anything with my heart. And I said, I was in a situation where he says, come to Washington, D.C., and I'll check on you. And there was no way I could go. So he says, I'll check to see if there's a doctor in New Jersey or Delaware, wherever I was. I was in Delaware. And 
he found a doctor. The doctor gave me a test on the tread, and treadmill, and he put some dye in me, and he said, something is wrong with your heart. You must get immediate care. <clears throat> and I said, I don't know what to do. He says, you can go right across the, the river to New York. And I'll put you in a hospital. And I went to that hospital. And it was a place that would care for persons who had... Uh, no insurance and... No uh, insurance and anything. Mm -hmm. And they would just check to see what the statement was. Of your heart. And they decided I need to open heart surgery. I had no way. Uh, open heart surgery when they were telling us all the different things that could happen to you in open heart surgery. And I sat there praying. There was a group of maybe 24 people that were going to have meet open heart surgery. This was in the 80s when they were not all that expert at it. No, comparatively the, the main place was in Texas. Mm -hmm for open heart surgery in Texas. Mm -hmm. I could not go to Texas. So I was sitting there very quiet and praying. And they were saying all the different problems that they the people would have to get open heart surgery. And it was the main area in, for, in New York City. What hospital was it? Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt. St. Luke's Roosevelt. St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. It's still there, so you can check it. St. Luke's Hospital. And they had a staff of doctors so they could take care of a number of patients in a single day. And so there were about, I don't know, about maybe 24 people in the room. And I was listening, and the, the doctor turned to me at the end after like an hour, and he says, you're very quiet. Why are you quiet? I says, I am praying, and what is God telling you? And I said this, God has given you the talents to become good doctors and good nurses. And you are going to take care of me and pull me through. I have no fear. I'm ready. And they put me on. They had all of these patients to go in the next day. And, and Dr. Kara was at her university. I could not even have contact with her. And they put me on the end of the list of who was going to be taken care of. And I survived. You forget, I was there. Oh, you came yeah, there. Yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, came I'm there sorry. then. I was there. <laughs> but... The Lord and many of those didn't survive, but the Lord. So answering your point there, Guadalupe, you know, I I just think the Lord knows what he has in store for us. But it's our duty to unite ourselves to him, you know, and be faithful to him. If we expect that he is protective of us. I mean, I sometimes tell my clients this. It's not just faith. It's common God sense. God is watching. It's us. common sense to believe in God because God I, is watching us. I would be terrified to be out of His will. It's it's self interest too, you know. <laughs> when you're with the Lord, His hand is protecting you, <laughs> and He sees what's happening. And He's in love with me. He's and in what, love with you. And what's the solution? With each of you. Is. He's in love with you. And so as long as we do everything to cooperate with him, 
we can just expect that things are going to go his way. As long as we're not blocking it. That's how I look at it. Does that make sense to you, Guadalupe? Absolutely, Dr. Chiara. I just love the way that, you know, in what Professor Romy just described, that beautiful moment where he connected with God and prayer, you know, and he does speak to us. It's like, you're not, you're not going to probably hear the way he spoke to some of the saints, you know, and we don't know if they heard the words, but he does speak to us. And it's like uh, our sense connects to him and, and something just makes sense there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Guadalupe. That's a beautiful thought. Cesario, did you have any reflections you wanted to share? Dr. Cesario Gomez. Well, uh, I have I have lived long enough to experience very similar situations to which you have just described. When I was in the U.S., a couple of times I went to visit my spiritual director in Minnesota, and I had the most horrible night with my car under a nice storm and very strong fog in which... Ice, ice storm, you're saying? Ice storm? Mm -hmm. ice, oh. it, it was in 2009. I think it was the worst night in, in, the, in 50 years over there. Maybe more than 60 accidents. Very So I was scared. And all the time I went to a scientific meeting with S S uh, Catholic Social Teaching and CPA and went mm -hmm. to a tornado with my car again to Atlanta, mm -hmm. 2008, uh, the same, same story. Oh. And I felt scared again. So, yes, after that you praise God, but what I'm, it made me reflecting about is sometimes you just lose you lose control of yourself. You lose control of yourself. You don't know what's going to happen. So it is a kind of dark night of the soul or of the spirit or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. get surprised and lose your control. So, yes. Uh, maybe you can give us some advice. Did you ever experience? Uh, a situation in which you you felt like you were losing control of your fears or your reactions, what to do about them? It's total surrender is what to do. Total surrender, total acts of trust. I mean, I obviously lost control when I'm getting through the air, you know, in the auto accident. Um, but it was just an involuntary reaction of my soul crying out to the Lord. You know, your soul cries out. When Rami one year ago had his stroke, total, you know, our, you know, I, I didn't know that he was going to recover as he has that you see today and one you know one minute we're having dinner eating a chomping away on a piece of corn and the next minute i'm calling 911 and your whole world is upside down um but it's total just total surrender the prayer most sacred heart of jesus i place all my trust in thee that cry from my soul is just a repetitive prayer when you can't sleep, when you have no relief in sight, when the darkness is so dark. Just most sacred heart of Jesus, I place all my trust in thee. And little did I know that was only the beginning of the saga of all sorts of trauma that we would go through together between hospitals and agencies and caregivers and suffering. 
humiliations and abuse and all sorts of things that you wouldn't imagine that people have to go through. And, and that is, it's kind of like when you were driving through that storm, how did you, what did you say to yourself, Dr. Cesario, when you held onto that steering wheel? What did you say to yourself? Tell us. What did you do? Well, I am a soldier. I am a warrior. I have been tried by my father. He was a military person to go move forward, whatever it is. Just go forward. Yes. Don't look back. This is what he told me. I, I just wanted to say a similar. I also am suffering heart problems. Heart oh. problems. And oh, I think the worst, the, the worst thing was once I was in the church. And I was waiting to receive Holy Communion. I was on the road and I was suffering, I think, something like a heart attack. And I decided what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out of the church or go to receive communion. And I told go Jesus, and I told Jesus, whatever you want, I'm going to receive you. I was absolutely filled with sweet, with cold sweet, you know? Um, and my yeah. clothes completely wet of cold sweet sweeting, white, my face white white. I remember the, when the priest saw me coming, he was scared because he, he, he saw something in my face. This man is really bad, you know? But yes. when, I, when I approached communion, to receive communion, those symptoms disappeared. Praise the Lord. Man. The symptoms disappeared of his heart. Your heart attack symptoms totally disappeared. Yeah. I went back. I, I, I went back to my bank and I was praying after Holy Communion. No symptoms. Praise you. This is, I think this is what you call completely abandonment. Yes. Something like that. Complete abandonment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a example. Yes. Romal, do you have another example you're saying? Yes, I have another example. Thank you, Cesario, for sharing that. Yes, go ahead, Romal. It was in Virginia, and I had my uh, fish wagon, and I had to go somewhere. And the hurricane hit at that time from the Caribbean, coming from the east to the west. And it hit in Virginia, and I had to go on the road. I forget where I was going, but I had a station wagon. And the wooden station wagon. And I had a mattress in the back in case I had to go to sleep. And I approached this area and I had the radio on and it said not to go forward because the river was rising and the hurricane poured the bridge. So I decided, I felt just at that moment, I came under a viaduct, under a road, and I decided to stop and go in the back and sleep in the back. And I slept all night. And in the morning, all the emergency vehicles were there on the road because the river had risen 30 feet over that bridge. 
If we had time to go over the bridge, cars were falling into the river. But I was under the bridge and nothing happened to me. And when they came, they says, who oh, is this man dead in the back of the car sleeping? <laughs> and I said, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm okay. And nothing wrong with me. I continued on my journey. And the, that by that time, the water was going down of that bridge. You and slept I, so long. And I continued my journey. <laughs> Nothing happened. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm so blessed that our Lord saved you, Dr. Cesario, so that you could work together with us. <laughs> and also for your family and all the other souls that you're going to be helping as you finish your doctoral studies as a psychologist. And Guadalupe, I'm sure the Lord has had his hand on you. He has inspired you with a, a brightness and a sharpness and a devotion to him that we don't know the full story yet, but maybe there'll be parts that will come to mind to share with us in the future. And we invite you to do so. So, Thank you both for your attention, your time, your sharing. God bless everyone that will hear this uh, recording in the future. And may you all be inspired to just abandon yourselves to the Lord. I think that's the ultimate answer, right? That's what we're all agreeing on. Yes. Abandon ourselves because his hands are safe. And it's the safest thing for you to do. So ultimately, it is your self-interest. But do it out of love. <laughs> Amen. So, so God bless you both, and we'll see you next God time. You. Bye now.